country. <laughs> well, welcome everybody, and I appreciate you being here and um, what COSA is doing along with our friends at NHPRC as our first uh, SHRAB conference call. Um, we're happy to have so many of you attending with some of the state archivists and some of the staff from the state archives. Um, we have a lot of exciting things to cover today and wanted to bring you all up to speed as we enter next week, uh, Archives Month. thought this would be a fitting time. Um, one of the most exciting things that's happening with COSA uh, is that we're going through a major transition. And you've heard Vicki um, entertaining you as we've gotten the call pulled together this afternoon. Um, but we're in the process of uh, hiring a new executive director today. And we'll also talk about the State Electronic Records Initiative, which is a major initiative of the um, uh, COSA. And we're working with lots of the states to deal with that. We'll talk about IPER, which is Essential Records um, Disaster Preparedness Related Stuff. We'll chat about advocacy, and an advocacy summit we're having this December. Um, and Nikki, can you slip to the next? Yep. Uh, or do I need to do that? Uh, there we go. Um, some of you may or may not have heard that we're having some issues in the United States related to the Georgia State Archives. The Secretary of State is um, kind of basically closing the archives, so we wanted to bring you up to speed on that and talk about that for a little bit. And then um, that hopefully will take 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll get into the Shrab Town Hall. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and Anne, are you on the call too? She is, and she's unmuted, I hope. Great. Um, Ann Ackerson is, uh, has been announced as the new executive director for the Council of State Archivists. She'll be beginning on January 1st, uh, and she's already uh, been kind enough to participate in a number of different things and is going through the process of transitioning. Um, we spent, the board spent about three to six months uh, going through the review process, and thanks to many of the state archives who participated in the search committee and all other related activities. Um, we've selected Anne unanimously. She is currently the director of the Museum Association in New York, has worked with them for a number of years. Uh, she's been serving as a SHRAB member, ironically, for more than a decade in New York, and um, has been very involved with all sorts of legislative and policy issues for the museums, um, not just in New York, but across the nation. And so we're looking forward to her leadership and her direction at COSA. And if you're on the call and can speak, That's, it's always good to have an executive director that always lets the president lead, so I appreciate that, Anne. I'm not <laughs> sure that she's able to speak yet. But anyhow, we're happy to have her joining us um, in January, and she'll be at a couple of meetings before then with us, so we're looking forward to that. Can you flip to the next one? Um, and you let me know, Vicki. Are you there, too? I am. You let me know when I'm supposed to stop and someone else is talking, okay? Okay. We'll just keep going. I think you're. I think you're good for this one. Then I do Iper. No. <laughs> okay. Um, the State Electronic Records Initiative was begun just a year ago, which is hard to believe. Last July, um, Kentucky and Indiana put some money up, some federal LSTA money, library money, to help develop and identify where the states and territories were in the country as far as uh, the condition of electronic records and what as, what we are as archives were doing to. Um, uh, maintain and, and properly preserve electronic records. And out of that came this entire Siri initiative, State Electronic Records Initiative. So we were fortunate um, this last year to receive a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services for uh, about a half a million dollars. And it's geared primarily toward education. Um, it, it's going to allow us, beginning in basically in January, to provide up to $1,000 to each state, territory, and the District of Columbia for continuing education, um, largely at the discretion of the state archives, the state archivist. Uh, there will be an application process or a submission process so that we have all the paperwork and verify that uh, the training, whether it's webinars or sending people places or bringing someone in to speak to the staff, that those things are all under the purview of the grant. But nonetheless, this is the first time I believe COSA has ever been able to provide continuing education dollars back to all 56 uh, members, um, states and territories. So that begins uh, in January. In addition, the grant calls for week-long, I think they're five-day um, electronic records institutes 
there's two levels, an introductory institute, which will be available to 24 states um, who are just beginning to develop programs, and then a more advanced uh, institute for those that have something in place uh, but may need some additional guidance, um, or those that have pretty strong programs but want to make them even better. And those institutes will begin sometime this summer and will last for a three-year period this summer up through 2015. Uh, and those will be spread across the country, we hope, um, in the east, midwest, and probably somewhere in the west. So those are really exciting things. Again, new initiative from COSA we're very excited about. Uh, another thing that you should know is that in October, for the first time, COSA um, will be recognizing Electronic Records Day on October 10th of 2012 as part of Archives Month. Um, we're very excited to do this. Uh, at the Santa Fe meeting of COSA and Nagara, someone who will probably forever go unknown in history um, came up to me and suggested that we have this Electronic Records Day and that we look at 1010 as the date because of bits and bytes being 1010. So I went to um, the National Archivist David Ferriero and suggested the idea to him, and he said he thought it was a great idea. And so from there, we've gone to this. Watch for next week. Um, Julia Young from Mississippi will be sending out an email to all the states with a couple of um, possible press release options to help promote Electronic Records Day uh, in about two weeks out from now. And on this whole Siri initiative, the next webinar, or maybe it's two webinars from now, on November 15th, will be on this whole topic of um, Siri and where we are, and we're doing that to help make sure people are clear on what the process is to apply for the continuing education grants and also the electronic records institutes. And if you want to go to slide six. Okay. And that's you. That's me. <laughs> this is Vicki again. Um, I wanted to just say a little bit about the IFER project. It was the Intergovernmental Preparedness for Essential Records project. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear about it while it was running, um, we received um, Sunday, actually, is the five-year anniversary of when we were notified that COSA had received its $2.6 million grant from the Federal Emergency Management Agency um, to train state and local government um, employees about essential records and, and protecting them um, from disasters. Um, it was um, an amazing project in many ways. Uh, they were designed primarily to be delivered by webinars, which is one of the reasons we've become at least more comfortable, if not super skilled <laughs> necessarily, with web deliveries and, and um, um, interacting the way we are today. Um, but we did prepare more than 150 instructors nationwide. Um, in webinar training techniques as well as on the content of these two courses, one on essential records and one on records emergency preparedness and response. Um, we also delivered that through those instructors um, in every um, state and territory, uh, 3,700 state and local government employees um, received this training. Um, our goal, original goal, was a little over 3,300, so we well exceeded that goal, and I'm thrilled with that. Um, these courses will both be available soon um, through uh, as self-directed versions through teeks.com. Um, it's a federal or a FEMA contractor who, who takes courses that have been developed under FEMA specifications and makes them available online free of charge. Um, those will um, bring with them certificates of completion that then are valid for various continuing education units and certifications. So they, they carry the same weight as the ones we've delivered. Many states, however, have also told us that the state teams have told us they're going to continue um, the training themselves. And so I, you can also uh, watch for training in your own states. Uh, perhaps you've already participated. And we certainly are encouraging that, and we'll do everything we can to support those teams in an ongoing way. Um, you can watch for whatever comes next in emergency preparedness from COSA. Um, at that website address that I give you down at the bottom. It's basically our website slash prepare. So stay tuned. Um, the pocket response plan, uh, we've sold more than 20,000 of uh, our pocket response plan envelopes. So we hope that those are in wallets all over the country um, in good use. And that will continue to be one of our mainstays. So 
Um, stay tuned and um, stay prepared. Thanks. Jim? Um, one of the exciting things that we're working on uh, is developing a archive community-wide um, advocacy agenda or awareness agenda about the archives community. Um, as we've gotten involved with the Electronic Records Initiative and even really before that, it became clear that we as state archivists and the state archives really need to do more to um, elevate uh, the public's perception of what we do and why it's important to them. Um, and so we have, COSA has, is spearheading a conference that we're calling um, this Advocacy Summit, which we're going to be holding in Annapolis, a half-day conference with the leadership, some of the leadership from SAA, NACARA, and we hope from National Archives to meet in Annapolis and kind of thresh out, flesh out a um, agenda for the archival community to talk about what are the topics that are really relevant and what do we need to be doing to make sure that the archives across the country are better positioned um, for funding, reduction of threats to us, like the cuts that are being faced in Georgia now, um, and raise our uh, uh, visibility so that funders and supporters can understand what we do and why we do it. And so there's some other ancillary things that are probably going to come off of this. Uh, COSA is also developing a publication called The Importance of State Archives, which will be rolled out soon after this advocacy summit is completed, we hope, uh, at the end of December sometime. So this is a real good opportunity for us to really elevate the profession, um, and we're looking forward to where that, where that heads. Okay. Vicki, you want to introduce Kay? I will. Oh. Hello, Kay. Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Oh, great. Um, sorry, I didn't figure out how this worked in advance. But um, I, I should say this is Kay Minchu of the Troop yeah. County Archives in Georgia, who's um, also the chair, correct, Kay, of the Georgia SHRAB? Uh, I am the chair of the Georgia SHRAB, which we call GRAB. And I'm the <laughs> co-chair. Thus, by default, I'm the co-chair of the um, SAVE preserve, help save Georgia archives coalition, so. So we've and, invited Kay to give us an update on, on what's going on down in Georgia. And we don't really have much of an update right now if you've been following things. I think two weeks ago today I had a call from the Secretary of State, Brian Kemp, he had just been to see folks at State Archives and told them he was going to close State Archives as of November 1st and keep a few employees. A few employees turned out to be three out of the ten current full-time employees. And it's all to save $732,000, which the governor has ordered each, each Georgia department to save 3% of their budget. The Secretary of State has several agencies under him. He chose to take all of his cuts in state archives. So the legislature is not in session now and won't be in session until January 16th. But just we've gotten great press, a front page story in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, just today a story in the New York Times, which Vicki is quoted in, and uh, Richard Pierce Moses, who's at Clayton State University as a professor, is quoted, and a couple of others. The, um, we got a Chronicle of Higher Education article, so we've gotten the best press we've ever gotten for archives in Georgia. But um, last Wednesday we met with the governor. This had been set up by Society of Georgia Archivists previous, as the governor declared October Archives Month. And so I went in and spoke on behalf of the 20 of us that could be in the office, and there was another probably 80 out in the outside office, and said that we were there out of concern for all Georgia archives, and especially state archives, and that we needed the governor's help in keeping the archives open. The governor looks me in the eye and said he's there to keep the archives open. So we all blinked a minute or two and cheered, but since then we've heard no details. 
So uh, Ken Thomas and I are going to meet tomorrow with the governor's chief of staff, and also we're starting to pursue legal action, legal ideas at least, to whether um, we can get an injunction or something to stop the archives from being closed. The trouble is if the archives closes November 1st and we lose those seven employees, we lose just a huge amount of corporate memory and corporate knowledge of how the archives operates. Right now it's scheduled to be open by appointment only with one uh, real person to help people to pull records or anything. So we just don't know how that can possibly work. So right now we're pursuing various options. We do appreciate everybody's support. Thank and I'm you. happy to answer any questions anybody might have. If you want to put them, since you can't do them um, generally, um, you could raise your hand and we can try unmuting you. We're having mixed success with that. Um, but I'd be happy to give it a whirl. Um, or you could put it in chat and we can pass the uh, messages that we can ask Kay ourselves. Hearing none, I'm scanning the for raised hands. I will say everybody's support has been tremendous. From COSA, uh, SAA, it's been very heartening to have that kind of support and knowing we're not just down here alone and in the hinterland, which it feels like right now. So. Well, and I've been saying too, Kay, it, it demonstrates the value of having an active and an engaged SHRAB um, yeah. and group of supporters more broadly in a state when a crisis like this hits. Yeah. And it's just kind of um, remarkable that we were planning this SHRAB town hall yeah. and then you got hit and hit with all of this. Yeah. So, um, uh, and the, the terribly sad thing is, as many of you know, Georgia's State Archives building just opened in 2003 and won several national awards. Our state archives has won awards through the years. It was established, I think, 1918. And we're one of the original 13 states. And so uh, you look back and say, OK, at what point could we have turned this around? And partly it's because politics gets involved with something that should just be. Um, we'll certainly work to make sure this doesn't happen again. But, and we do suspect our Secretary of State is um, somewhat not playing politics, but doing the political game. But it, you know, it involves people's access to their own records. So it is. It has been pretty dreadful, and it would be downright depressing if we didn't have our colleagues and friends, both in the state and elsewhere. And all that said, I'm not one of the employees at State Archives whose job's going to end or anything. So it would be even more depressing on that angle. Well, we're all behind you, and we'll follow. And um, I encourage you all to visit the um, website address of, um, how do you pronounce it, FOGA? FOGA, yeah. <laughs> FOGA.org. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're doing a nice job of, of posting announcements and news as it comes along. So thank you, Kay, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you all. OK. I'm going to give you just a brief overview of this survey. I hope you were able to find, most of you were able to find the, the preliminary report that I posted. Um, if you go to our website, slash shrab, slash town hall, um, you'll find a, a, a description of today's event with some, some links to um, uh, the uh, handouts, the two handouts, one from me and one from Dan Stokes. Um, the, the encouraging news is that 46 uh, states reported that they do have a SHRAB. There are still um, six states that haven't reported in, so I can't verify for sure. Um, I'm assuming that most of those um, that haven't been able to respond yet um, have something going on. Um, the territories are, are um, not quite as um, involved, but they are trying. I know for one, um, Virgin Islands is, is working on it, and uh, um, that's uh, a, a new area of growth for us as an organization is the territory. 
We even have um, someone from Guam on the call today. And I think she had to get up very early in the morning to do this. So we appreciate it. Um, the, uh, it in most cases, um, uh, so there is a shrab. And it, the spread of the number of members in each shrab varies widely from state to state. Um, you can see that most of them are between 9 and 12 people. But right now, we're running a, in the 46 shrabs that reported in um, nearly 500 people uh, working in shrab. Um, I think that that final total will be a 510, 515, something in that neighborhood. So there are a lot of you out there, and I hope that you'll be able to find ways to communicate with each other and collaborate. Um, one of the things that um, has always been a key part of SHRAB uh, work is stre doing strategic plans, uh, not only for their own work, but for um, records in the state as a whole. Um, and uh, right now, 26 report having a uh, written strategic plan. Um, some of them are, exist but are out of date. Um, and there are a couple that are working on them, and only two without a plan at all. Um, but the, uh, some are, are older than others, and uh, most indicated that they were um, still, I think, useful, um, but may not be the central focus of, of um, some of the work, um, but, but still uh, an important part of, of setting the program. Um, we did also ask what your activities were, and you'll hear a different take on this, or if, it, it certainly reflects similar um, trends to what Dan will be talking about. Um, but delivering workshops and training uh, appeared to be the most common thing you're up to next to American Archives Month. And Dan will be talking more about that activity. It's certainly a, uh, uh, an effort that we at COSA as an organization supports. Um, Becky, who's on the call with me from the COSA staff, um, has set up a Flickr page with images of all of the American Archives Month posters. And I'd say, Becky, what would you say? Most of them are from SHRAB. Um, there are some other repositories and institutions that, that create Archives Month posters. But I think the bulk of them come from SHRAB. And um, uh, it's just really a lot of fun to see those every year. They make great decorations. We've got three on our front page now. And um, keep it up, because they're, they're a wonderful way to celebrate the month. Um, there are still 50, there are more than a third of the SHRABs reporting so far are doing regrants. Um, I was encouraged, frankly, having in the being in the process of wrapping up this IPER project, um, that about a third of the of the SHRABs are doing something about emergency preparedness as well. Um, so that's where we're going on. Uh, our, that's what we see so far. Um, I also wanted just very briefly to tell you about the resources we have. Uh, for, some, for several years, we've had a SHRAB support center. It's not real active, but it's there. And I wanted to make sure you knew about it or were reminded about it. Um, there is a directory on our site of, of all the SHRAB web pages, so an easy way for you to get from um, state to state and look at what other SHRABs are doing, perhaps look at their strategic plans. Um, uh, six years ago, we developed, we had an NHBRC grant to develop orientation materials, both for the state coordinators and for incoming SHRAB members. Uh, we still have those materials available. Um, they're pretty much OK. They probably need some updating, um, but uh, they're essentially, um, uh, you know, some, they're pretty basic. Um, but a way to get uh, the SHRAB members to understand the, what NHBRC's goals are and how their work as, SHRAB review, or as NHBRC grant reviewers fits into the larger mission and how they fit into um, this network of, of SHRAB nationwide. Um, we do have um, the survey results from our 2006 SHRAB survey. And as soon as we get this new report done, we'll get that posted as well. Um, we do have a, a page, too, um, for I'm going to get really brave and see if I can bring this up. No, nope, that's not going to get there. Here, this is the SHRAB Support Center on our site. Um, and uh, the Tools and Resources section we have does have something, uh, because so many of you are involved in um, workshops, I want to remind you about the Basics of Archives Continuing Education Program that was developed several years ago. Um, a number of SHRABs I know have used it. Uh, Kathleen Rowe um, uh, from New York worked on this, along with um, colleagues at, in Michigan and Ohio. And um, ASLH uh, actually helped us 
um, uh, and delivers actually delivers the courses. I don't know if they're still doing it, but they have been for a long time um, and or were for a long time. So you can find out more on, from their site. We have information about um, our American Archives Month. I see that we have the old version of the FAA um, Public Relations Kit. They now have a I Found It in the Archives program that they promote, um, and we will link to that soon. Um, uh, and uh, just a few other things down um, that you have available through here. So uh, we are planning very soon to set up a SHRAB discussion forum. We use a, a Basecamp, which is an online um, project management system uh, for document sharing and collaborative work um, for the COSA committees and subgroups. Um, and we're going to set up one for SHRABs and invite all SHRAB members to sign in and have access to that. I imagine we'll move some of these materials from the SHRAB Resource Center or, or connect them um, so that you'll have access to those as well. So now I'm going to call on Kathleen Williams. And let me make sure I get you unmuted, Kathleen. I think that's it. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can, can, we? you hear, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, well, I'm um, between two uh, powerful speaking bookends. Vicki preceded me and Dan Stokes will follow me. So my task is very simple, to be brief <laughs> and to the point. And the first thing I want to say is thank you. Thank you to everybody who serves on a shrab um, and who's joined the phone call today. A quick look through the um, call-in list uh, for me prior to the phone call uh, today shows that there are 35 states represented on the call plus uh, the District of Columbia and two territories. So I think that's a pretty good turnout for the first um, webinar for SHRAB. So I want to just take a moment to thank everybody for their service on behalf of the NHPRC and on behalf of their state and the, um, those who care about historical records and public records in their state. I wanted to reiterate things I think you already know, um, but I think it's important to state, you can't state it too frequently, um, the critical role that SHRAPs play um, in um, their states and critical role for NHPRC. And Vicki's survey, I think, provided a very nice list of all the kinds of things that you engage in. And I think Dan's um, follow-up comments will um, talk about that in particular. One, one thing I did want to talk about that you do for us specifically is review grants. You are um, the eyes and ears in many ways of um, the peer review process. We have independent peer reviewers, but we are very, very dependent on state boards, uh, every one of you um, participating in that process of assessing, evaluating the um, merits of whatever funding proposals um, come our way every grant cycle, and that's an invaluable, invaluable tool for the commission to have before it as it deliberates and make re makes recommendations to the archivist on how to um, um, spend taxpayers' dollars um, in the wisest possible manner with the best possible results that we can anticipate. So um, besides everything else you do within your states, um, that's a very, very specific task that you take on on a very regular basis that provides um, enormous um, uh, benefits to the commission. And I wanted to make sure you understood we appreciate that. I also wanted to make sure you understood that the grants program for the SHRABs um, at the NHPRC is an integral part of the program planning for grants that takes place every year at the commission. And that is an abiding um, commitment that we have to the state boards and to what's happening in the states. You really, you guys are the boots on the ground in so many ways through your planning and programming. And that that's um, seen by the commission and by the archivist as just an essential component of what um, the commission is all about and what it's trying to accomplish. So I want to make sure to take a moment to, to reiterate that. And finally, I wanted to make sure you all knew that um, we are here at NHPRC to help. 
in any way we can and in any way um, the SHRABs and the coordinators um, see fit. Um, that uh, can take the form of, if it's helpful, um, Dan or myself uh, making ourselves available for uh, even SHRAB meetings, either virtually or in some cases uh, physically if we can find the travel funds. If that's a help to the board in trying to either think through processes, explain things, um, more clearly in person or just sort of get um, kind of the brain cells working on new ideas and new concepts and moving forward with them. So I w lastly wanted to um, throw that out there that um, we do see this very much as a partnership um, and we want to be as helpful as we can be here in Washington, D.C. to what you are trying to, excuse me, trying to accomplish out in your states. So I want to make sure that every SHRAP member who's on the line today understands that. It's a very important relationship to us here in Washington at the Commission, and we want to continue to cultivate that relationship. So thanks again for joining the call. I think at this point I can probably be muted again, and we can hopefully bring um, Dan Stokes in. I think he follows my comments. Dan, are you there? Am I here? Yes, there you are. <laughs> Good, I'm here. Basically, uh, what I wanted to do was, in a shortened version, um, go through uh, what we had as a fiesta at the Santa Fe meeting in which we uh, went through the various activities that boards are engaged in. Uh, this concerns mostly those that were awarded funds uh, this past November and are, are just starting or are partway through their activities. Um, as Vicki mentioned on the website there is a more detailed list of which state is doing what activity. Basically these are lists of the performance objectives that were developed around the grant and so uh, you may want to go to that document to find out who is doing a particular type of project a particular way because uh, what I'll be going through are just one or two minute riffs on each of these. Um, to give you some ideas of the variety of ways that boards are doing um, similar activities. Um, at the Santa Fe meeting, this first one was called training, but a very distinguished gentleman told me, you train animals, you educate humans. So we'll call this education and professional development. Um, what different boards have done, some have, uh, have hired SAA to present a workshop for them either a workshop in person or a webinar. Um, others have developed their own curriculum. Uh, California last year or a few years ago did a uh, grant writing workshop um, and developed that on their own. Others that don't want to go or don't have the resources or don't just can't go through the, the effort of putting on a workshop will offer scholarships so that board members, not board members, but other people outside can training um, that fits what they need to either go to a workshop being offered locally, regionally, nationally, and uh, pick what they'd like to do. Sometimes these cover all the expenses. Some of these workshop uh, training grants are as big as 2,000. Some are just a few hundred or 150 even, just to help people who may not have the resources get some training um, on their own for a certain topic. Um, others. Um, are offering, still using the, the uh, basics of archives that Vicki mentioned on the website, putting together very basic workshops that are open to everybody. But others have decided to have found a need to target audiences. So some states are targeting town clerks or rural caretakers of records or Native Americans to offer specialized training for those folks who they have found are in special need. Um, in addition to targeting audiences, some people target topics rather than doing just a basic archives that tries to cover everything. They'll do um, grant writing workshop, recruiting and training volunteers, um, how to conduct research, basics of electronic records, um, caring for historical photographs, things like that. So you can, you can do something that's more specific if you feel like um, you some states have felt that they've generally covered the state with basic training and are now ready to do uh, something a little more um, detail. Uh, the time periods for these are open. Some people do half-day workshops. They find out that people are willing to drive in in the morning but want to drive back home at night and so they just do a half-day in the middle. Others find that people are willing to do a full day. Um, most don't extend beyond that but 
that's an option to go longer than that. Uh, some people to help um, get some more interest will coordinate their, their uh, educational opportunities with Archives Month, or they'll do it in conjunction with a board meeting so that the boards can participate, or in a professional uh, meeting, um, such as the state historical organization having its annual meeting, just to kind of coordinate these things more and potentially save money, or get people who are already coming to a meeting, you can add a little extra to what they can participate in. Um, and some boards who have developed their own curriculum offer both in-person uh, workshops, but also make their curriculum available online so that people who maybe can't travel at all can at least see um, what folks are learning. Uh, the second item, Archives Month, which comes complete with illustrations. Um, many boards do the posters, but we also find it very helpful for those states who develop online calendars. Um, some states have bookmarks. Is one of these a bookmark, it looks like it? Yes, the um, preserve your digital memories and stand yeah. the bookmark. Very collectible these days, as they say. Bookmarks, <laughs> love, people love them even though they don't have books. They'll stuff them in their Kindles, so they still like them. Um, also distributing these, some folks send them only to historical uh, um, institutions. Others have expanded and are, are sending these posters and other information to legislators to remind them, you know, it's Archives Month and, and you need to support us. Uh, so there's a variety of things going on there. And I'll just mention that I've been giving Keith Donahue, our communications director, uh, copies of these posters and other information. So he's going to be highlighting uh, the archives during Archives Month on our uh, Facebook page. So make sure you look for that. You might find your state. Um, <laughs> I've, I forget which ones he's doing, but we'll just be surprised. Um, he's going to focus on that this coming month. And Dan, mm -hmm. and before, before we leave Archives Month, I actually want to try a little interactive activity. We're going to try doing a poll. The poll is open, and I'm not sure what you're seeing. Can you see a poll on your screen? I do. And it, it asks, um, is your SHRAP doing anything for Archives Month? And you're able to um, uh, check off which of those things um, you're, you're doing. And there's uh, choices or posters, repository tours, conferences, or speakers, other special events. And oh, the things are rolling. And I should, if we're lucky, I should be able to display the results of this poll when we're done. OK. So just give it a minute. And it looks like this is, as I said, this is all new to us. <laughs> so looks like maybe, maybe we're done. Becky, do you know how I display it? Hmm. I'll close it. And then share it. Oh, there it is. Did it come up? Yep. Cool. So two-thirds posters and a lot of other good stuff um, going on. So thank you for your tolerance. <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> you're all see. still awake. I know that some states who have offered lectures and things like that um, have found entirely new audiences have come in. Um, I'm not sure if it was an archives month or one of, I know some states do statehood day and other events where a, a talk was done um, on a topic related to agriculture, farming history. And all these farmers who'd never stepped foot in the state archives wandered in to listen to this lecture and they had a whole new audience that they didn't realize uh, was out there. So these uh, events often bring in surprises of, of uh, new audiences we can get. Uh, the next slide will start with a regrants, I think. Let me get back there. there we yes, go. regrants. There it is. Next to the bag of money. Yeah, I um, said to somebody earlier today, I had a tough time illustrating these. And all I could come <laughs> up with was an American flag and a bag of money. So that looks good to me. Go for it. So the regrants vary. We have some states giving as little as 500, some giving as much as 7,500 individual applicants. So that the amount can vary. We have found the people are overjoyed to receive and can do a lot with just a few hundred dollars. Um, some states have have different types of programs for regrants. Um, smaller regrants, they may allow people to apply anytime, and they'll approve them quickly. 
And then if you want more than, I believe one state has, if it's more than $1,000, there's one deadline, and that has to go through a, a bigger review process. But under $1,000, they do a quick review, and uh, those can start quickly, um, and there isn't quite as much delay. Um, some folks, usually the bigger regrant programs, will accept anybody and allow anything appropriate. Uh, some folks who have smaller programs will do have a preference for smaller institutions, or they'll say uh, only institutions that have trained staff or volunteers, or they uh, may focus on getting applications from Native American or immigrant groups. Some may focus on the types of records. They'll say we're only looking for people who have government records in private facilities to find out what other government records are out there. Some uh, focus on institutions with uh, less than 500 feet of records. Um, another state is, is requiring a public access component to any project. Another is getting um, specific about looking for projects that deal with vanishing businesses and institutions so that they get documented before they disappear. Um, some boards get more involved after the regrants have been made than others. Uh, some will assign board members to do oversight of the regrants so that if you happen to be near or traveling near a project, stop in. This, I think, uh, points to something that we are trying to um, increase, which is making sure that actual members of the board are involved in these projects. Sometimes they become uh, state archives driven, and the staff of the state archives does the work, and um, the board may have a, only a small part. I think um, we'd really like to see that board members will be involved in these uh, more, um, in addition to going to meetings, but also being involved in monitoring projects. Um, some states, I know board members are teaching the workshops or giving the lectures at Archives Month, so having board involvement can be important. Um, different states have, have focused on various areas, either records preservation, disaster planning, improving access, just buying supplies. Some of these $500 free grants are merely to buy the boxes and the folders that you need to properly house records. Some are focusing on digitization. Some are offering consultant grants so you know at least where to start. And we're still, we still have folks doing uh, microfilming of uh, records that have um, longer term value. So these can be anything that you see fulfilling a need in your state. Uh, the slide that showed the number of states with plans, um, generally we want to see that these free grants will address something in your plan. I know some states don't maintain a formal plan, but every year um, or every other year we'll get together and do um, priorities, strategic priorities rather than a whole planning process, which is, I think, acceptable. And so um, as you plan for the next year or two, um, having a regrant program that does address those issues uh, could be important. Uh, what is for on-site assistance? Some folks don't do regrants, or in addition to doing regrants, they have Roving archivists, traveling archivists, um, Pony Express archivists, they call them everything. These are archivists who will do visits to various sites and um, review their policies and procedures and activities, maybe conduct a quick records inventory, um, and then write a report on what might need to be done to improve their programs. Some of them offer um, a half day in which they'll kind of review the institutional needs. And then the second half of the day will be a workshop to do training on various activities. Um, some of these are very are longer. Some of them are two days. Some of them are one day. Some of them are half a day. Whatever you think uh, will work in your state. Um, some of them have a, a half day visit, and then help you with implementation, and then do a follow up visit to make sure things are going well. Just to follow up and make sure um, the initial visit actually helped. Um, and once again, these can be for a variety of, of, of reasons and of different types of institutions. Um, Montana has a traveling student archivist program in which instead of a professional archivist, who many of these are, they link a student, usually a graduate student, with an institution where they spend seven weeks 
helping them with various projects and um, and then leaving behind sometimes um, a manual on how to continue the work that was started. Um, these are usually, I believe their requirement is that small underserved institutions with significant records that are open to the public. That's their criteria. And the students don't come from Montana, but are imported. They import their students from either uh, Wisconsin or Washington. Um, and that's been, I think, at least two, maybe three years, and has, has been really successful for them. As you can imagine a traveling archivist to go to too many places in Montana would be difficult. So they have one person who goes one place. Some folks have, have uh, well, these traveling archivists have uh, chosen just a portion of the state. Pennsylvania, I think, did like northeast. Other states have chosen different areas so that it doesn't get uh, too cumbersome. Uh, resource development, this is things like um, some states have, have developed processing manuals for, uh, this is the last guy I believe did a process, or is doing a processing manual for remote, culturally diverse repositories that may need some special kind of assistance. Or developing best practices um, and activities such as that. We have awards programs. Um, interestingly enough, George's is coming up soon. We'll see how that works. Um, where the Secretary of State of Georgia usually gives out these awards, I believe, and we'll see how that works. Uh, they have Governor's Awards, Outstanding Achievement Awards. We've provided funding to finance these. Usually it's either to pay for uh, plaques or trophies or, or to um, um, just put on the event itself. Um, we also have um, linked to this our National History Day activities where some boards uh, give awards for the best use of primary documents to document their state or to purchase supplies that are used by National History Day or to send uh, winners to the, uh, the National History Day uh, event up in Maryland. Because um, I can imagine some states far away, it's difficult to get uh, their winners um, all the way across to the East Coast. So that's an option as well. Uh, conferences and summits. Uh, some of these are full day with keynote speakers and breakout sessions and panel discussions and all kinds of stuff. Uh, these usually have 30, 40, 100 people at them. And we've provided partial funding to help either people attend. There have been travel grants to help them attend. Or there have been grants to help um, pay for speakers or for speakers' travel, uh, whatever might be the area where uh, you lack funding. We do realize that sometimes it's easier to get money for one thing than another, and we can help fill in the gap where it might be easier for you to give someone an honorarium. You can't pay for their travel, but we could help to cover those things. So we can fill in the gaps where the funding doesn't exist. And board assistance, this is everything from, uh, I think it was Colorado that uh, hired a consultant to help them create a, a more useful website. and show them how to use social media more uh, appropriately for their work. Um, you can bring in a staff assistance. I know some of you are lucky enough to have people on the staff uh, who can work on these things, um, help with all the administrative work of the board. Others don't. And we can pro provide some assistance um, to help you with that. Uh, other board assistance we've given are for when you do planning retreats and have had hired a facilitator to help guide or to help even uh, write drafting your report. Um, and we've provided board assistance also, of course, the general assistance is we provide money to help you pay your travel expenses so that people can actually get to the meetings. Um, not a huge issue for some boards, but as I mentioned, Alaska before, it, it costs a little bit to get around in Alaska. And so uh, a large chunk of, of their funding goes just to, to get the board in one place so they can see each other. Some boards do conference calls and face-to-face. -face. I think it is good to have a, at least one face-to-face -face meeting each year. Uh, we can help uh, provide funding to do that. So that's my list. And, I see um, um, a couple of questions. Um, would you mm -hmm. be willing to entertain them? And I can um, unmute Kathleen Williams as well. Um, Kathleen Rowe, um, I'm unmuting you. you. I know you had one that you put to us in chat. 
Okay, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, yes, yes. we can. Yes. Okay. Um, when I, I look through the list on, you know, every year or year by year, there are things that I think, oh, we did something like that, or oh, it would be great to build from that person's thing. Um, is there some central source of all of the SNAP projects that have happened so far so we could, you know, because maybe this year somebody will be doing something and I won't have that on my mind, and, and in two years I want to look at that, or so we could, first of all, know who's doing what. So, frankly, I think it would be good for us to build on each other's work rather than redo, or at least partially redo what someone else has done. And two, is there a central location where we could see each other's stuff and be able just to, to access um, if there are products up online. For example, our state board has put a lot of things up online and mm -hmm. you know, putting some workshops up online. You know, how would people know about that? Um, and over time, not just, you know, I could send something out to the COSA list, but, you know, that's a one-time thing. So I think would, there's so little money for NHPRC that it would be great if we could use it the most efficient way possible. Uh, the first line of defense on the, um, redoing things over and over and over is obviously we review these proposals and say, well, you know, you could use this person's or I to, to talk about the California uh, grant writing workshop that was already sent to a few people who were planning to do that and now have a means to do that. Um, I think we might want to somehow combine all of the performance objectives because there's there are there's one of those for the last few years. But of course, those are two separate documents, and it might we might want to combine them and say, in this year this was done, and this year that was done. So it's one big document rather than having to go look several places to find these things. Well, and, and this is Vicki. Actually, this is one of those ideal things that's perfectly suited for that TRAB discussion forum on Basecamp. Mm -hmm. um, as we get into that and explore it, that could be an excellent first trial um, to get people used to coming in and looking and seeing what's available. and. I, I can already imagine how we can break that um, information out in a way that would make it more usable. So um, let's work on that. Yeah, and I think we need to um, just find out from you all what what sources of information you're likely to be checking and what's going to be useful. If if we could do, you know, on the list serve. Um, a quarterly update of, oh, here's here's some results from the various states, and here's where you can find information about this. If that's too transitory, then we need to put it somewhere else. I remember a uh, social media expert said, you shouldn't be on every site doing, you shouldn't have a website, a Facebook page, a blog, and da, 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 all this stuff. Mm -hmm. People won't know where to find your information. You need to choose the ones that will work for you best, and then focus on those few. So uh, if we could decide what those few are, I think it would be very useful because I know New York, uh, practically every grant New York has received has been to create curriculum that can be used by everybody. The security, electronic records, uh, the basic, the project now that's doing a much broader institutional evaluation, I mean, that's all stuff that's going to be very useful. Uh, and I think we need to identify where to put that so that everybody will be able to make use of it. So Vicki, as a practical matter, can we work with you on getting whatever content we end up with and, and information we have as to um, where resources, what resources were created? And Absolutely. What, so that yeah. we, could, we could use the new SHRAP forum or whatever means necessary to put that sure. stuff up and keep it fresh? Sure. And that actually, one of the performance objectives in our current grant from you is <laughs> is to work on this SHRAB, the, uh, the, what we were calling uh, a SHRAB um, discussion forum. And so I think that was our solution. We talked about the possibility of setting up a listserv for all SHRAB members. Mm -hmm. And uh, at our meeting, at least, the state coordinators and wearing your hats as state archivists groaned, basically, at the <laughs> idea of having yet more email coming in and another right. listserv to keep track of. But the nice thing about Basecamp is it is static in that you can go look at it when you're ready to go look at it. The stuff is there. You can send email out to the entire group. Um, and we can get, we will work out a process and let you know in the next three to four weeks how to, as in each individual has to be registered separately in the, in the Basecamp and, and in the forum. So um, we will need to collect names and email addresses for any SHRAB members who want to participate. Um, we can give the, all the state archives 
um, directors are, or the, the coordinators, I believe, already have Basecamp accounts. So all we have to do is click a button for them. But we need, for anybody who's not already in the system, we'll need to collect those names and address, email addresses. But that won't take too long. And this group may be the best one to start with. The people who were, um, we've already got your names and email addresses from being in today. So maybe we'll just send you an email and tell you to opt out if you don't want to be part of that. And we can start with this group. Um, does others? Uh, we we have uh, we're right at the top of the hour, but if anybody else has a question, we could unmute, or we could just sign off and see where we're going next. Um, I'm watching. I'm looking at the uh, attendee list for questions, and I don't see any other hands raised at this point. This yep. is Becky. There are a few questions in the question box. Can you see those, Becky? No. I, somehow my questions box disappeared. <laughs> if you'd oh. like to post those, that would be great. Yep. Um, I can just read them. It's probably the easiest. Sure. Um, Tony Adams asked, um, can Dan's points related to number 3 through 8 be summarized and added to the handouts? Dan, are you still there? Yeah, I'm basically I can do a, uh, <laughs> we could pass, actually what we could do, I suppose, is add at the top of that document that lists all the performance objectives on what, 12, 13, 19 pages, uh -huh. uh, a summary section okay. that kind of does in one page, and then you can go look. Uh, that might be helpful. That'd be great. Well, just uh, when you get that done, send it, shoot it over to us, and we'll post it on the site. What's next, Becky? Um, sorry, and then um, Dan Cantrell said, or suggested that NHPRC could require as part of the grant that any products that are produced be uploaded to the site. I think we could maybe, this is of course up to you all since it's your site, um, and we can pos possibly do it at NHPRC, is um, prepare links, because obviously if the curriculum's on New York site, we could link out, uh, mm -hmm. do a brief description and then link to that site. Um, and then for other products, do the same thing. We kind of do that now, but I don't. We don't keep up with it well. It's where the project description is, we kind of have put links, but links change over time. So I think we might want to find some dedicated way to do that to kind of yeah. provide links that uh, that go and make it easy for us to check them from time to time and see what continues to work and what doesn't work. So we can keep that updated. So we might try to see which whose site that works better for. Yeah, and that would be in inside of Basecamp, too. Each individual would have control over updating their own links, which might help, I think. But we can talk about that. Yeah. That's a, that would be wonderful. I've For 30 years, I've wanted a way to get access to an HPRC project result, so. Sometimes I have, too. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so that'd be great. I'd love to work on that. Uh, any more, Becky? That was it about um, NHPRC. Okay. Well, I've got another poll. <laughs> One more time. Um, how often should we do these? Uh, how often, if, if this has been useful, how often would you like us to see, I'd like us to sponsor one of these online town halls? Uh, we don't want to inundate you, but uh, we do want to stay in touch. So they're still coming in. A few more. We're almost done, folks. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Anybody else? Last call. OK. I'm going to close it and share it. The consensus oh. looks like twice a year. So I was afraid you were going to say we're rarely or never. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I learned early on in good survey management that you also always have to have an option for everybody, no matter how <laughs> good or bad. So um, I'm grateful that at least everybody who responded said at least once a year. Um, so we can look at our calendar and try to do it a couple times a year. I think it would be a wonderful opportunity. Um, and by the time the next one convenes, maybe Anne Ackerson, who unfortunately we couldn't get unmuted. I apologize, Anne. Um, I will probably be in charge, and since she's been a SHRAB member, she will be especially sympathetic to all of this work. Um, just a couple more screens to run by you. Uh, next month, 
um, uh, they will be doing a. Re I will mostly, I think, be doing a report out on the fall survey that we that the Shrab survey was part of. Uh, every two years, we do do a survey of the archives and records management programs, and this data has already been critically um, important for us um, as we responded to our questions from the New York, at least for that New York Times article. Um, of course, the first thing the reporters wanted to know was how. Uh, Georgia compared to everybody else, and I tried to do that delicately, but um, with the new fresh numbers in hand, it made it easier. And then in November, we'll be looking in more detail um, at the um, CIRI, the State Electronic Records Initiative. Of the, we've got uh, nearly $500,000 grant from the Institute for Museum and Library Services um, to fund um, uh, training education, <laughs> Dan. Um, uh, and scholarships uh, for electronic records training for state archive staff. Uh, again, a critical need. Um, and we'll be going into the um, state archivist on this call today. Um, we'll especially want to tune in because it will tell, that session will tell you more about how to access the scholarship money that we'll have available and um, get ready for the institute um, next year, that begin next year. Um, Jim Corden, do you have anything else to add? as well as us out today? No, I just appreciate everyone um, spending the hour with us and uh, taking the time to do this. And we'll look forward to having the next one of these in the fall, um, or the spring, excuse me. And uh, we'll bring you even more and better information. Uh, right, Dan, you and Kathleen will help us That's right. make sure we have the best shrabs in the world. <laughs> and by then, we'll know better how to use GoToWebinar, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your patience and your participation. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.